morning. Um, the Kleins, there we go, uh, to the Kleins, thank you for sharing your story. I know for so many people you have been evidence of that uh, there is somebody else in the fire. There's another in the fire. So thank you. Thank you for all your work and your, your ministry. Um, well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. It is uh, a communion Sabbath. It's a communion Sabbath. Uh, communion Sabbath is something that is beautiful. It's powerful. It's deeply significant. It's sacred. But it can also be uh, somewhat complicated for uh, many of us. Um, did you know that communion Sabbaths in the Adventist church are generally the least attended church services out of the other services in the year? I remember I learned that as a kid, and I was always confused as to why. It never really made sense. Usually... You have to wait all the way until after the church service, and then you get home, and then you have to wait for the family friends to arrive, and then everything's set out, and you're just smelling the food. You're waiting. You're waiting. Finally, you have lunch around 2 o'clock, and it's awful. As a growing boy, it's the worst. Um, so why would people not want to come to the one time you get refreshments provided in the church service? Why would you, why would you not want to come to that? I... I thought maybe, maybe, it's just that people are really insecure about their feet. They're insecure about the foot washing service. And I thought, well, okay, I guess that makes sense. It wasn't until I was uh, older that I started to understand maybe some more of the real reasons why uh, communion Sabbath makes us, or can make us, uncomfortable. And I think some of those reasons are both interesting and, I believe, indicative of a misunderstanding at large of what communion is and of what it's meant to be. So this morning, let's have a brief conversation about communion, what it is, what it signifies, and what we believe about it. And that way, as we do communion and as we partake in communion this morning, we can have the right focus as we worship together. To begin with our understanding, let's read from the account in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, to see what the biblical account of communion is. A good place to start. So this is Mark 14, verses 22 through 25. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So, just a few takeaways from first glance at the story from which we draw the practice of communion. This is the account of Mark. It's in all the Gospels, or at least some version of it. Something that we can take away right at first glance is that Jesus himself is the one who gave us the first communion. He instructed his disciples what to do. This is important because it wasn't just a disciple or a believer later on, whether they had good intentions or bad, that thought this would be a fun or a healthy practice. This was straight from Jesus himself. The practice of communion is directly from Jesus. And second... Jesus gave them communion, gave us communion as a symbol of his sacrificial death. Communion, and this is done for the sake of remembrance. Jesus doesn't do communion just for the sake of pity from his friends that he's about to die. They didn't even fully understand that at this point. Jesus gives us communion so that we may remember, so that we may remember. As Adventists, we believe that communion is something we do together as a church. We do it to remember together as a church. The belief of communion is actually, it's baked into Adventism. It's actually a fundamental belief, number 16, if you're curious. And not only that, but we believe in something called open communion. Open communion. 
This means, as the belief statement itself says, that the communion service is open to all believing Christians. Essentially, anybody who is a believing Christian or wants to come and partake in the communion service, they can do so. We believe in this thing called open communion. We believe that it's something we do together and that it's open to anyone who wants to participate, which is a wonderful belief. It's a wonderful idea that uh, it's something that we do together, that it's open to everyone, but it's also an essential one for us to distinguish. Because if there is such a thing as an open communion, that um, means that there's probably something called a closed version of communion, and there is. Closed communion is the idea that not everybody should or should be allowed to participate in the Lord's Supper in communion. And this isn't merely just to be exclusive, to say we can participate and you can't, um, but the belief is that those who partake in communion in the Lord's Supper should have an understanding of what it represents. They maybe should be trained in the practices of how it should uh, take place. It's in some ways out of respect, but it is also more exclusive. Believe it or not, this is actually the more quote-unquote traditional belief. Some of the more older classical church denominations hold to this idea of closed communion. Some of those churches that still hold it today are the Catholic Church. Traditional Lutheran churches often practice closed communion. More Orthodox churches and even many Baptist churches today still practice the idea of closed communion. And while Adventists believe in open communion, there is actually an apparent epidemic that is affecting both open and closed communion communities and churches alike. Something that I believe is indicative, again, of this misunderstanding of what communion is about, what it signifies, and what, it meant, what it's meant to be. If you went tomorrow morning and you attended a Catholic Mass, you would likely be invited to join in the service. If you've ever been to a Catholic Mass, uh, don't worry, I won't tell on you. I went for class, so it was okay. If you've ever been to a Catholic Mass, you know that there's a lot to participate in. There's lots of standing, sitting, kneeling, standing, sitting, kneeling. Uh, there's lots of singing. There's listening to the prayers. There's saying prayers out loud. There's a lot to participate in. And you would likely be, if it's a welcoming Catholic Church, you would be invited to participate. But there would be one element of the service that you would not be invited to participate, and you would likely be asked to remain seated. Not that they check your Catholic card at the door, but unless you're a believing baptized Catholic, you probably shouldn't participate. And that is the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion. And the way they do it in the Catholic Church is everybody kind of stands up. This is the usual practice, at least. Everybody kind of stands up. They get into maybe the middle aisle. Everybody would stand here. Pastor Mario, if he was the head priest, I, no, no offense, he would be standing up here at the middle. He would have the cup, and he would have the other emblems, and he would uh, just give it to people individually as they came down the aisle. It's a little bit different from how we practice it. So... As you would likely not be participating in that element of the service, you would remain seated, you would see other people getting up and going, and chances are that you would look around and you would see many other people remaining seated as well. And you might think to yourself, as somebody who is uh, abstaining from participating in this Eucharist, in this communion, you would think these must be other Protestants. And maybe I can go over them and talk to them and have a good old chuckle about the Reformation and all the wonderful things that Protestantism and the Reformation has given us. But you likely would be mistaken. In fact, the Catholic Church has noticed over the last couple decades, and likely it has been for quite a long time before that as well, but just since more recent study has been done on it, that people, baptized Catholics, who are allowed and invited and even expected to partake in communion, are not participating. They may come to Mass, they may come and participate in the standing, the sitting, the kneeling, the singing, the praying, the listening, whatever it is, but they're not participating in communion, even though it is very fully available to them. One reason that I think this is, and this is echoed by many other researchers that have been studying this apparent ep epidemic of people not participating in communion in the Catholic Church, is that Catholics have a, a belief, a stipulation, that if you have committed a quote-unquote grave sin, you must repent 
before you are allowed to take part in communion. And so many practicing Catholics will attend Mass and not take communion. This is likely because the term grave sin is somewhat broad and not necessarily uh, super definable. So many believing, practicing, even devout Catholics will question in their hearts as to whether they are worthy or not of participating in communion. So as a result, there is an ep epidemic of self-perceived unworthiness in the Catholic Church. And as a result, an epidemic of people not partaking in communion. According to a Pew Research study done in 2015, only 40%, 4 out of 10 Catholics who regularly attend Mass report that they take part in communion. 4 out of 10, 40%. Now, I realize this is a lot of talk about Catholic practice for an Adventist pulpit on a Sabbath morning, but I do think that our church, even though we practice communion differently, we face similar dangers, similar misunderstandings, believe it or not. As far as I can tell in my research, no definitive study has been done in the Adventist church on attendance and participation in communion. We haven't quite hit that Pew Research uh, level of, of attention yet, I guess. But it is widely accepted as general knowledge within church leadership circles that attendance will be down on a communion Sabbath. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, that may be other people, and I've never not participated in communion. But that's likely because our church tends to make it uh, pretty easy to join in communion. Unlike Catholic Mass, we don't stand up and all join an aisle. You remain seated, and the emblems are passed out to you. No one is skipped unless they choose to be skipped because we practice open communion. As the deacons pass it down the aisle, they don't say, I'm sorry, have you been Adventist for the last couple years or are you uh, just somebody off the street? You are invited, everybody is welcome, the emblems are brought to you, you don't have to do much. But that doesn't mean that you can't leave before communion happens. You see, there's this wonderful thing at church that we like to do, and it's called trying to follow Christ's example as best as possible. It's a wonderful thing. So, of course, following Christ's example through the story, we often, as a church, will practice the foot washing service before we remember the Last Supper. And if you're expecting or wanting to duck out early, it's perfect, because everybody gets up and leaves and goes out of the sanctuary, and it's a perfect time to dip out. You don't have to awkwardly wash your feet. You don't have to come and sit through the communion service. It's a wonderful thing. It's a perfect time to dip out early. And it may be for an endless amount of reasons why you or we or anyone has ever skipped out on communion. It may be that that only that ducking out early, that's if you came to the service at all. Many people will see, oh, it's communion Sabbath this week, and they may not come at all. In fact, we may have people here this morning that may not be here or may not have been here if they knew that this was a communion service. It's not a shameful thing, but it's just a reality of what it is. The reasons are many why we may skip or want to avoid communion. Maybe communion makes you uncomfortable. Maybe you came alone and you don't want a stranger to wash your feet. Maybe you know communion services tend to be long, and like me as a kid, you just want to get out and have some lunch. Maybe it's something more serious, a personal trauma with the church, or reasons that it just isn't what you're into. And maybe if it's a problem in the largest Christian denomination in the world, Maybe it's possible that Adventists have even caught some of the unworthiness epidemic. Whatever your personal reason is, if you have one or if you even just have an uncomfortability with communion, whatever it may be, let me say here from the pulpit this morning, this church is never, never here to shame you for not participating in communion. If even after this message this morning, you still plan to duck out early or you need to leave before the foot washing for any reason at all, let me just say that uh, we are not going to judge you. It's okay. <laughs> but if you are feeling antsy and debating whether or not you want to participate today or ever again 
in the future with communion, I invite you to reflect with us this morning on what communion is and what it truly represents. John Calvin, the reformer who was a complicated individual to say the least, he once said that skipping communion, this is paraphrasing, skipping communion is like being sick and refusing to take the medicine that will heal you. But communion doesn't really have medicinal properties for us physically, right? Even in a spiritual sense, this isn't to say this will never happen or it's impossible for this to happen. If you have nothing but doubt in your faith, chances are that taking communion would not instantly cure you. It may, but chances are that it wouldn't be the pure medicine to save your faith and what you believe. But there still is something powerful about it. There is something powerful about communion to the point that even devoted and devout Christians need to take it on a regular basis. There is something about it that even the most faithful disciples need to do it to remember. Let's go back to that reading from Mark chapter 14. The takeaways we saw was that Jesus himself led out in communion. This was not something we do in church for no reason. It's not some silly practice or silly tradition. This is from Christ himself. And Jesus didn't just give it to us so that we could remember his death. He wanted us to remember something even more. Jesus said this as he gave them the cup. He said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus didn't just say, my blood will spill. He said, my blood of the covenant will spill. Jesus wanted to make sure that even as we remember his sacrifice on the cross, we don't forget that there was something more significant than just a man dying. This was about the climax of human history, the dramatic tipping point of a world filled with sin becoming a world free to choose grace. Jesus didn't just die for some good cause. Jesus died for the good cause. Jesus died to fulfill a promise. Jesus fulfilled a covenant. Last week in youth Sabbath school, um, we talked about the story of God's covenant with Abraham, or Abram at that point. And we went over it again. I don't know why for some of us this morning. Uh, again, and it's a wonderful story. If you haven't read it with your child, I highly recommend you do not do so. Um, but it is a good story about covenant, but it is a very ancient cultural practice that uh, is kind of crazy for us today. But we, when we read that story of God's covenant with Abraham, you realize how seriously significant a covenant is. It's not just a promise. It's something so much more powerful and deeply significant than that. God made a promise, a covenant to Abraham that he would fix this mess through his descendants. And that happens all the way back in Genesis. Genesis 15 is when God makes a covenant with Abram. And the wonderful thing about the Bible that we have now today is we can skim through, just flip through the rest of the Old Testament to get to Mark chapter 14. And here we see God making good on his covenant promise. You see, communion isn't just about remembering that Jesus died. That's just Christianity and world history 101. Communion is about remembering that a sacrifice was made for you, for me, for every single human on this planet. The death of Jesus was not just spilled blood. It was spilled blood of the covenant, a promise, a covenant fulfilled. Every time we eat the bread, drink the wine, we remember and declare to the world that God not only keeps his promises, we declare that God has kept the most important promise of all, a covenant he made to Abraham, a covenant he made to Noah, a promise he made to Adam and Eve in the very beginning of this whole human experiment. It was a promise he then fulfilled through Jesus. So today, as we remember, as we remember the servanthood and the character of Christ through foot washing, and as we remember the ultimate sacrifice that he made for you and for me,
for the many. Remember that God is a God who makes covenants and who fulfills his promises. I invite you to stay this morning and to declare that with us all as a church this morning. Amen. Now for the foot washing, I'm realizing, can I borrow the order of service from somebody? I thought there was one up here. The, 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 I need to say where the different foot washing is. That's it for the sermon. Thank you. Does it say on the... Women's is in the Sabbath school, the adult Sabbath school room over here. Couples, the couples is in the fellowship hall, couples and families in the, fe- in the fellowship hall. And then the community Sabbath school, the community room over here is for the single men. Um, all right, so we invite you to stay. If you need to duck out, again, no judgment. But we invite you to stay with us for communion as we, as we worship and remember together this morning. <laughs>